Um, so if I asked you for two minutes of your time to show you that man and dinosaur live together, what would you say? You, would you be interested to listen? <laughs> See some strange looks. You sure? <laughs> Listen, I don't have time to talk about this here, but I would love to show you this book outside and flick through a th few pages and, and show you that. But um, the first time I asked someone that question, <laughs> the very first time I asked someone, can I, show, can I have two minutes of your time to show you that man and dinosaur live together, was here at a Creation Ministries evangelism tent at the Redlands Easter Festival. Have you ever been to that, the Redlands Easter Festival? Um, so, I was really surprised at how many gospel conversations I had after discussing dinosaurs. I was new to the creation evolution debate. Um, I've been a Christian, which is really strange because I've been a Christian 15 years. And in that time, I'd studied science, I'd worked as a scientist, but I was told uh, this issue is an issue you should avoid. It's not really good for evangelism. So, I was really surprised how I kept talking about Jesus after talking about dinosaurs and creation evolution. Um, and shortly after this photo was taken, I spoke to someone, not, these people were very nice, but I spoke to someone who was angry with God. Have you ever met anyone like that? Yeah? yeah. Met someone angry with God? Um, I'm actually quite strange, and I enjoy the challenge. Um, but sometimes I do just steer clear from them because I think, oh, it's not going to end well. And often I'm insensitive to their reasons why they're angry with God. So those of you that met someone that's angry with God, have they ever told you why? Any reasons? Anyone want to shout out? Didn't do what they wanted him to do yet. Yeah. So the lady I met, she was really open. Like a lot of times they're not that open. They're just angry with God, right? That's what I find. But this lady was really open and it really changed my perspective. And that's what I want to share with you. Um, she said her issue with God was suffering. I've suffered. I know other people that have suffered. I'm upset with God. Uh, like many people, she was asking, God, why have you created all this death and suffering? Like we die and we suffer. And the biblical answer is really straightforward. It's God's good creation, and it's man's fall. God created the world to be very good, but it was man's disobedience that caused the fall. Now, I'd not given this answer as simply before, but at the tent uh, with this lady, and there was a few people with her, with my newfound confidence in the Bible's answer to history, I was able to give, or the Bible's account of history, I was able to give this answer. But the reason that I hadn't heard the answer much before, I hadn't heard it spoken in church very clearly, often I'd heard the why, or sorry, the how, how suffering, but not the why. And the reason is, is because the prevailing view uh, that we're taught is that this is how the world has always been. Over billions and billions of years, there's been death, disease, and suffering. This is the naturalistic view. But can I just ask, can I walk around? Or is this camera? Do I have to be on the camera? Okay. <laughs> um, so this is, this is the prevailing view, right? And this is what we're taught. This is what um, I really appreciate when you were praying for us, by the way. Um, you understand that actually this is, the biblical view is not the view in society. It's not the view that we're taught. Um, it's not the worldview we're taught at school. It's not the worldview in universities. It's not the worldview on TV. It's not the worldview in magazines. And therefore we get different answers. So this is the worldview that is throughout our world that we're taught at school in magazines. But what's the Bible's truth? Yeah, I said to the lady, I said, I agree with you. The world is broken, but this is not how God created the world. He created a very good world without thorns, thistles, death, and disease. In fact, Adam's sin was an intrusion into God's good world. So how could God be good if this is the only thing that's in view? How could God be good? Does anyone know a young person that's grown up in church 
but has since left church. Do I have hands up? Can you keep your hands up for a moment? Just have a look around. It's like a lot of us, right? A young person, they've grown up in church, but now they've left the church. Um, and you're not alone. The American-based Christian research group, Barna, uh, they recently released statistics on Australian millennials. So that's 18 to 35-year-olds. And they published this, I think it was last year or the year before. Um, this is the president of the Barna group. And I got to hear him speak when they released it in Australia, because they usually just do statistics on America. Um, so a Christian polling group. And they found that 71% of the millennial generation that grew up in church drop out. So that's in Australia. Um, So they then went on to ask these people a question. They asked them, what makes you doubt the things of a faith the most or the things of a spiritual nature the most? What do you think their answer was? Number one answer was science. Second was hypocrisy in the church. Third was human suffering we were just talking about. Fourth was conflict in the world and fifth was history. So science was the main thing. There's a little graph. I'll skip over that day. These are my hidden slides. (laughs) So I I went to, uh, when he released the notes, they did a church conference and lots of churches were there and I was listening to this guy and there's two things. So he's the president and so he's interviewed or been involved in interviewing thousands of young Australians um, and asking them this, these kind of questions. What about faith? What makes you doubt faith? Do you believe? And he said this, the next generation have questions that the church is not prepared to answer. And he went on with another poignant question. Can the church help the next generation think through the questions that they have with robust answers? And I was sitting there with a colleague saying, you need CMI, the church needs creation ministries. And this is really what we're about, is giving um, young people answers, but also they need a place to dialogue and talk about these things, because what they're learning at school is different to what they're learning at church. And they've either got to have two separate lives or they've got to find out the truth and they can choose one or the other. Um, And so that's why we exist. That's why we've got loads of resources. And I'd love to tell you lots and lots about science and philosophy, but I've got a short amount of time. And so if you've got time afterwards and you want to ask questions or you want to get some resources, uh, meet us outside. And this is our website, creation.com. So if you've got a question about theology or science and you want a biblical worldview answer, this is a place to go. Um, we have 5 million unique visitors a year. There's 14,000 articles on there. There's a search bar. Just use it like Google, basically. And if you want to get connected with us, um, I've got these Did You Know flyers, and they're on your seats. And uh, what you could do there is you can fill them out and you'll get our email, which comes out about every two weeks, and we give you a biblical worldview on topics that are coming out right now, on scientific issues, on news issues that are coming out. Uh, So it comes out about every two weeks. So if you want that, you just have to fill in your name, email address, and postcode. So we ask for your postcode, because if we're doing an event near you, near where you live, we'll tell you. Um, So if you you haven't got a pen and you want to fill it out, just raise your hands, because we've got some extra pens here. Has anyone got a pen to fill it out? One reason I want you to do this is because on the first email, you get a free uh, video streaming or download, I'm not sure, but it's called Creatures Do Change, But It's Not Evolution. And that's going to tell you the difference between natural selection and evolution. Now, you might have heard terms like microevolution and macroevolution. Has anyone heard those terms? Yeah, Uh, so it's that kind of thing. So there's a difference between natural selection, what we really see, and what is theorized about what happened in the past. Um, So I, I don't have time to talk about that, but... You'll get that for free if you sign up. And if you don't want the emails afterwards, you can unsubscribe. But I I think that it's really worth it. So why does this matter? We've been talking about why does this matter. Um, I'm going to talk about geology and how geology confirms biblical creation. And then I'm going to wrap up and conclude. But so far, what have we learned? That evolution makes God look like the bad guy. He was the one that created this world with death, disease, and suffering. And it also turns our kids to atheism. Okay, what about this? What can we do? Uh, Because evolution appears to have the backing of science. So it appears that we've got evolution versus the biblical creation account. And this is a tough battle to fight, as science is often considered a great authority on things of the past. 
It uses testable, repeatable experiments to establish facts. It's impartial and without bias. It's not held by history or religious opinion, or so we're told. I believe the great perception we have of science is because of the great achievements that have been made because of experimental science. We put men on the moon. We've developed life-saving medicines. The world's information is now available at the swipe of a finger. These are the results of experimental science. There's another type of science that I'll talk to you about in a bit. But experimental science follows the scientific method. Theories can be tested, results are observed, and because an independent scientist can repeat the test, we can see that the conclusion is verifiable. So who came here by a car today? Anyone walk? Yeah, one person walk. Anyone by bike? Bike? Oh yeah, cool. Okay, so. Nine, maybe 99% of us, I came here by car, 99% of us came by car. So we, who came by car, we put our lives in the hands of experimental science today. Thousands of explosions per minute got you here. You are very confident in experimental science. And so you should be, because this type of test, it's a repeated type of test. And actually, it's been performed in car engines billions and billions of times over 100 years. So you should be confident. Car engine doesn't usually blow up. <laughs> and it's tested. But historical science is different. Historical science, we can't even test once. So we need to be careful before building on it, especially before building our worldview or our life upon it. This is an example. This is a paleontologist. It's a type of scientist that looks at fossils. And he's looking at a fossil, and he sees these two bone fragments and a few teeth here. So can you guess what type of animal this would have come from? And what did you say? Dinosaur someone? Yeah. <laughs> so th this is what he, he, said, he thinks. So he's just kind of extrapolated the lines. And, and you know what? That's a reasonable conclusion. And maybe he's seen a lot more fossils than us. And maybe he's got a better idea. But would you bet your life on that? You, you can't be sure. He hasn't got the rest of the fossil. He doesn't really know for sure. Um, he is a scientist, but he's working like a crime scene investigator. He wasn't there when the thing happened, so he uses the evidence. But unlike, the, who watches CSI or so, what, what are those programs? CSI, something like that. Okay, and, and they do amazing things, right? And they find the crime. But fortunately for him, this animal died a long, long time ago. And there's no living witnesses to bring forth. It's a very different type of science. So... It, historical science, you cannot even test things. You can't use the historical method. You can't use the scientific method, sorry. <laughs> uh, but despite this, he decides to press on anyway. And he imagines a half lamb mammal and half whale. Now, you might think, well, that's a bit of a stretch. But I didn't make this up. This appeared, this picture here, in full color, appeared in the journal Science. It's one of the world's most prestigious scientific journals. You've got Science and Nature, they're the two big ones. Um, this creature was given the name Pachycetus, all based on two bones and a few teeth. Um, and the discoverer was so confident, he said this, in time and in its morphology, which just means shape, Pachycetus, so Pachycetus is, it was found near the coast of Pakistan, Pachycetus, Cetus is kind of a name sometimes used for whale. Um, Pachycetus is perfectly intermediate, a missing link between earlier land mammals and later fully-fledged whales. Now you might be asking, why did, he, um, imagine, why did he imagine a half land mammal, half whale? Why not a stray dog or an ancient horse? Well, the reason he imagined a half whale, half land mammal was, the prevailing view at the time, and still is now, that land mammals have evolved into sea mammals. And so he was hoping that he might find one of these soon to be discovered, yet to be discovered, white ones in the middle, like an intermediate species. That's what he was hoping. But seven years after the discoverer made that assertion that he's perfectly intermediate, they found more bones. It was actually his PhD student that found more bones. So they found more bones seven years later on, and now they think he looks more like this. So more data leaves less room for imagination. So let's sum up. Experimental science, it follows the scientific method. You can test hypotheses to see if they're correct. We can do conclusions over, we can do experiments over and over again and get the same conclusion. Whereas historical science, it uses beliefs and assumptions about the past. 
And because it's unrepeatable and unobservable, you can't test your hypothesis. Okay, so we're going to talk about geology for a little bit. So geology is all about the ground below our feet. Um, and the underground is of interest to me because I studied and worked as a geophysicist. Um, this is a geological column, and it's representative of the different layers that are underneath the ground. So it's an average kind of thing. So wherever you look on the Earth, you'll find these kind of fossils lower down, and you'll find these kind of fossils higher up. Um, this is interesting because there's a principle called superposition, and all that means is that the layers on the bottom were laid down first, and the layers on the top were laid down later. So you've got a relative timeline. The evolution story says that more complex creatures evolved from more basic creatures. So it could appear that the evolutionary story is affirmed by the geological column, um, because we have the more basic creatures at the bottom and the more complex ones at the top. Now, this is a powerful argument. Millions of years of sedimentary layers with fossils in order of their complexity. So powerful that a lot of people have said, what are we to do with the Genesis account? It's been said that we should try and incorporate the millions of years because of the rock record. We should incorporate that into Genesis, so keep our faith intact. Whilst this might sound like a noble idea, keeping faith intact, while not disagreeing with real evidence, it's actually more harmful than it first appears. By accepting millions of years of rock record, we compromise the gospel. Now that might sound extreme, and before um, I'd looked at the creation evolution issue properly, spent some time looking at it, I didn't understand this. Uh, so I want to explain it to you. And a picture really helped me. And you, you might be here thinking, come on, Scott, rocks, fossils, the gospel? It's got no effect on the gospel. <laughs> and, and that's really what I thought at the start. But this picture helped me. So you've got Adam and Eve rejoicing in God's good creation. This is before the fall. Um, everything's made and they're rejoicing. God saw everything he made and he said it was very good. But now if we try and incorporate the rock record into this scenario, we want to fit the millions of years into Genesis, we've suddenly got a record of death that happened before Adam and Eve were there. The rock record actually speaks of death, disease, and suffering. As soon as I saw this, I thought, oh yeah, we get fossilized cancer, fossilized tumors are in here, fossilized thorns, fossilized thistles, evidence of bite marks of animals eating each other. That's not a pre-fall world. So remember the timeline. This picture is saying that death, disease, and suffering came before Adam and Eve. But the Bible says that death, disease, and suffering came after Adam and Eve sinned. There's a different order, do you see? And remember the curse, Genesis, the end, the first, last verse of the curse in Genesis 3, to dust you shall return. Adam's sin brought death into the world. Romans 5.12 tells us this. And it's actually why we die now. We're born into the bloodline of Adam, and therefore we will die. We are not made to die. God did not create us to die. And this is why he sent Jesus. Jesus died so that sin could be paid for and that we would rise from the dead to eternal life. So you can see the problem. If we accept the rock record, um, then we remove the effect of the Genesis 3 curse, and thereby we undo the doctrine of original sin. Um, that's the verse in Romans 5.12. But I'll just give you this quote. This is um, an atheist saying this in a debate with one of our best Christian apologists, and he says this, if there never was an original sin, I agree with him in this statement, by the way. If there never was an original sin, there is no need of salvation. If there is no need of salvation, there is no need of a savior. And I submit to you that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. I think evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. And just so I'm quick, I'm going to skip over that slide. But this is a summary now. Evolution makes God look like the bad guy, turns our kids to atheism, but it also compromises the gospel. So what are we going to do with the rock record? Do we need to refuse the evidence that's under our feet? So the answer is no, because the fossil record is best interpreted as order of burial during the flood, during Noah's flood. 
In fact, this interpretation actually explains a lot of the anomalies better. Because in a great earth-moving event like the Noah's Flood, you'd have the bottom-dwelling marine creatures. They're the first ones that are going to be buried. And then they're more upwardly mobile creatures as you go. Even dinosaurs are where we should expect them. They're quite near the top, not almost, because they're said to have lived in swamp environments. So I'd love to explain more about that to you. If you've got any questions, you ask me later. But the flood, you might be thinking, the flood, a real worldwide flood, Scott. <laughs> Hang on, we've been told that's metaphorical. Well, the Bible doesn't seem to think it's metaphorical. The Bible spells it quite clearly. It's got a lot of verses like this. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of that month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. What I'm pointing out is this is a specific day. If it's just a metaphorical or a poem, like why would you talk about specific dates? And there's three times that happens through Genesis 7 like that. And you know what? Historically, we didn't think of Noah's flood as metaphorical or allegorical. This is Noah's art from the 1771 Brit Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, so the Genesis account, if the Genesis account of the flood is true, we should also see evidence in our earth. If there's been a worldwide flood, we should see evidence in the geology, and we do. 75% of the Earth's continents are covered in sedimentary rock. 75% of the surface of the continents are covered in sedimentary rock. Now, sedimentary rock is made by fast-flowing water. So for sedimentary rock to cover such a large amount of the Earth, you need a lot of floods, <laughs> or maybe one big one. In 1964, marine fossils were found on the summit of Mount Everest. 29,000 feet above sea level. Anyone know where this is? Sahara, yep, good. Sahara Desert. I guess what you find here? Wali al Hatim, Valley of Whales in the Sahara Desert. There's a lot of whale fossils here. Okay, so if I just make a map and I put dots where I've found marine fossils that I've shown you, we've got some here in the Sahara Desert, we've got some here in the Himalayas. Um, you think, well, how did they get there? But actually, you know, if I made that map bigger, and uh, this is just a secular site I found that maps out where all the fossils are, um, and I've put marine fossils on here, and you see all those dots. Some of those blue dots, the bigger blue dots, represent 40,000 marine fossils. The continents are covered with marine fossils. Now, I want to just talk about fossilization. How do, how's a fossil made? Now, this is the type of thing that you'll see in a museum. Uh, you might see in a museum today, uh, whether they're fading this kind of interpretation out, I don't know. But it's what I was led to believe and taught while studying paleontology. And this is how they say fossilization occurs. You have a fish swimming along. Um, one day it dies, it sinks to the bottom. And over millions of years, you have uh, layers of rock um, come above it, and it eventually fossilizes. The flesh decays, and it fossilizes in place. But can anyone see the floor with this scenario? Someone can see the floor. Anyone keep fish? Anyone keep fish? Who keeps fish, yeah? What happens when your fish die? They float? Yeah, they, they float. Do, do you see them float? Mostly, any kind of, um, air, any kind of uh, marine organism that's got some air in it, <laughs> when it dies, it will bloat and float. They don't sink. And what happens when they bloat and float? Uh, who, who's been snorkeling? Maybe more people have been snorkeling. When you go snorkeling, do you see on the bottom of the seafloor lots of dead fish and dead organisms waiting to be buried by the slow sedimentation rate so that they can be in that perfect position so that they're, fo they're fossilized just like that. No, you see a clean seabed. That's what you see. Um, okay, so we're left with the question then, how do you make a fossil? And I w before I answer it, I want to ask, does it take a long time? Do you need a long time for a fossil to form? Do you need a long time? And we love to talk about this. Um, this is a, it was an article in our magazine a few years back. Did anyone, anyone see this article? So a few people already subscribed to the magazine. Anyone subscribed to the magazine yet? Yeah, a few of you, yeah. okay. Okay, so if you didn't see the article, which I don't think anyone did, I want you to tell me how long did it take this fossil to form? It's an ichthyosaur, it's two meters long. How long did it take it to form? Is it, is it any clues? Oh, I'm gonna give you a clue. Not long, not long, okay. I'm going to give you a clue. So you're saying not long. A clue is it's female. Does that help? Yeah, why does that help? Okay, okay for the... You see that? It's a baby. It's giving birth. This, I, I mean, 
I've got um, two kids, and I was there for the, uh, the pregnancies and the births, sorry, the labor period. Um, and they, it was pretty excruciating, but I'm glad it wasn't millions of years. It would have been tough. Um, okay, you see this poor fellow, he didn't even have time to finish lunch. Okay, I saw this a couple of years ago, and I thought it was great. <laughs> um, you see this? Uh, there was a, a Japanese researcher, and he was in a, in a museum in America, and he saw this, and he said, gosh, this looks like this is a school of fish swimming. And, and actually, he did the analysis. He looked at the direction that they were all going, and he did a statistical analysis on it and said, this is exactly like a school of fish swims. So how did they get buried in the position that they swim in a school? Um, one person commented on it, he's a paleontologist as well, he said, I've never seen this kind of preservation, I can't picture a three-dimensional school of fish sinking to the bottom and maintaining all their relative positions, that makes no sense to me. Different worldview, evidence makes no sense under that worldview. Okay, so we've seen that evidence that fossils can form very rapidly, and we've found for a fish to fossilize that it shouldn't die slowly of natural causes. So how do you fossilize something? Well, I'll just give you a quick answer. So you've got a fish swimming along, and we bury it suddenly with a lot of sediment. Very suddenly, so that two things happen. One, no oxygen can reach the fish, or just a little amount, so its body doesn't decompose too quick, and microbes don't eat it too quick, because the bones need to stay in this relative position. But you need to let some air get to it, um, and then you can keep it in its position so that the bones will remain intact. And then over a longer period of time, the minerals from the um, groundwater will go into those bones, and eventually those bones will be mineralized into a rock, i.e. a fossil. Um, now, to get this type of burial effect, we need a lot of sediment. The Fukushima, 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 Fukushima tsunami <laughs> um, in Japan, 2011, I don't know if you remember that, big tsunami, um, but it only produced a few centimeters of sediment. That's, n that's not enough. To bury just one fish like this, we need meat experiments say we need meters of sediment. We need to bury it because it's got a tendency to bloat and float and come out of those few centimeters of um, sediment. So to get this fossil to sediment, uh, to fossilize, we need, get this fish to fossilize, we need a few meters, and that, to get all of these fossils, billions around the world, we need hundreds of meters. We really need much more than Fukushima tsunami. <laughs> I'm maybe saying that wrong. We, but we need a worldwide flood uh, to make all those fossils. Okay, so Noah's Flood, there's a lot of other questions about Noah's Flood, and we've got some books. I don't think we have this book with us, but there's a lot of questions about Noah's Flood, and we've got some resources to answer those questions. So I'm just going to come to wrapping up, and I'm going to say, what can we do? Uh, we've seen that observational science confirms biblical creation, and that evolution compromises the gospel. So I'm going to ask, what can we do? Um, has anyone found this information useful? Yeah. Okay. Do you think it's important that we know this? Important that others know it? Okay, good, because I'm going to talk to you about what can we do, what can you do, because, uh, and this is why we come. So first of all, my first encouragement is this, to, the Bible encourages us to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And I think evolution is the biggest thing at the moment that's setting itself up against the knowledge of God. And so, first of all, I would like to encourage you to demolish arguments in your own mind. This took me some time. I grew up a non-believer. I, um, I went through university as a brand new Christian. I didn't know any of this. And so I got taught a lot of things that I needed to research and find out, well, what's the answer? What's the answer to that? So if you're sitting here with questions today, I want to encourage you, get the answer. Whether you go to our website, you get a book, sign up for our email, get the answer. The answer's there for you. Um, or ask us later. So settle in your own mind that the Bible is true. Get that settled first. Demolish that argument first. That's important. And then reach out to kids. I did have a video clip. I didn't have time to show it you, but these kids are learning about evolution <laughs> on TV. And, and we need to get this message out there. In previous generations, a simple believing Jesus, a, a gospel message, was sufficient. But now we need to start because they're already indoctrinated against God. We need to start somewhere different. And I looked through Acts one time. You know the book of Acts? I looked through it, and I looked every time Paul and Peter preached. And when he preached to the Jews or the God-fearing Gentiles, he, he just gave a believe in Jesus gospel message. And he referred to the patriarchs, and he referred to things that they would know about. But when he spoke to non-God-fearing Gentiles, two times, Acts 14, Acts 17, 
Both times he starts with God who created the world. God who created the world. Um, and so we need to do the same now. We're in that same kind of time now. So to reach these kids, we're going to need to be equipped. And I can't be the guy, I'm not going to be the guy pushing you out of the helicopter. <laughs> but I want to encourage you, get equipped. You see, he's equipped to rescue these people out of murky waters. And um, some of the equipping, the biggest thing that we've got is the creation magazine. Who, who already gets the creation magazine? So, gosh, there's a good few of you. Yeah, okay, good. And this, this is a fundamental resource. I was, had a great chat with John earlier. He's saying five kids, 18 grandkids, all five kids following the Lord, had the creation magazine in his household as, he was, as they were growing up. Um, Wendy at the back, is it three or four kids? Three, Wendy, three kids all following the Lord. And it's, that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, that's my mission for, for you today. That's what I would love for you today. If you've got kids that are coming up to school age, I want to encourage you. The reason this is our number one resource is you can buy a book today, but that might go on the shelf. It might get lost. This comes through the post four times a year. And the thing is, you're getting different message on your TV screen. You're getting a different message in school. We need to counteract that somehow. We need good information about what's really happening. So I want to encourage you to get that today. I'll just give a short testimony. This guy wrote in to us, and I loved it. This guy, his name is Vin, Vin Lopez. And he uh, became a Christian, uh, and, his, and then he got involved in talked about creation and evolution. And he'd talk about it a lot in the evening time. And his son, when he was a young man, uh, a young boy at school, was listening to his debates and conversations over the dinner table and became really convinced himself the Bible is true. And so when his son gets to high school, I think it was maybe 12, 13, I can't remember the exact age, but he's being taught evolution in biology class, goes back to his dad, says, dad, they're teaching evolution. I've got, I've got to say, say something. His dad says, my advice to you would be just pass the exam because you just need to pass the exam. But I, you know what's true, so that's good. Um, son says, okay. The next day he comes, dad, I couldn't help it. <laughs> He ended up in a two-week long debate each time they had the biology class with the teacher. And he sent a testimony and he said, your, um, the biology teacher was no match to your resources on your website because he kept going back and researching on the website. But what he said was that his son found that all, a lot of the kids in the class would go outside and said, I think you're right, I don't believe the teacher either. And I just thought, what a great testimony. We've, um, we're sending us kids, I mean, even sometimes even in the Christian schools, unfortunately, but um, if we get, especially in the state schools, we need to equip them, we need to prepare them. Um, that's another testimony. Sorry, these are hidden slides. So, there's a, if you want to sign up, there's a sign-up sheet, and you can have one or three years, give us your details, and you'll get the magazine. And you can give a gift subscription as well. Um, one of my colleagues did this to some of his family, and they got saved as a result. So if there's someone you think, hang on, they could do with this magazine, you can actually give it to them. You've just got to fill out that bit at the bottom and give the person's details. Um, and if you, if you get it today, you get these extra bonuses if you get three or a one year. So that's good. So if you already sign up and you want to um, renew your subscription, we can give you these extra bonuses. I think this, this is a voucher that you can use today. Is that right, Wendy? So you can use this voucher today. Um, and I'm just going to talk about one book. There's loads of books. I'll just talk about this one book, uh, Creation Answers Book. This has got a lot of the main questions. Who did Cain marry? You heard that one? Adam is Eve, Eve's kids. Who did they marry? <laughs> um, what about the millions of years? What about the Ice Age? What about the ape? Eight man human fossils, all those kind of questions that you get asked. Whenever I go and evangelize on the street and I talk to young people, they're always asking these questions. They're all, we put them in this book. It's not a specialized book, it's a broad book. And I want to encourage you if you know a young person or if you know anyone that's asked you these kind of questions before, buy them the book. Um, and, and listen, if um, we're, we're a non profit, so it, we actually have donations. So if, if money is an issue for anyone, but you think, see the importance of this, please let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll get the book for you and the ministry. We have people. You can have a one-year subscription for free. If, you've, if just money's like a difficult time at the moment, I think it's $32 for a one-year subscription. But just tell us because we want to get this into your hands. Um, and that's fine. And if you want a video, I recommend that one. Although I think you can get that one on YouTube now. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to have all these slides. I was just going to show this. If you want to watch things and you really want to get into the subject, I'd recommend that. That's 12 DVDs. And we've got kids' resources as well. Anyway, I'm just going to skip through these slides. Oh, so I'm going to summarize here. <laughs> so in summary, what I want to tell you is that you are not... Monkeys are wonderful. Apes are wonderful. God's creation, amazing. But you are not an evolved ape. You are divinely created in the image of God. And there's no one like you. You are totally unique. God appreciates you and he appreciates your intention. 
and your affection. But you're not perfect before the Lord. Your forefather, my forefather, Adam, sinned. We're born into his bloodline, and he died, and likewise we'll die. But Jesus did not intend this. God did not intend this for you, and so he sent his son. He took the penalty for your and my sin. And he raised from the dead. Colossians 1.18 says, Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. So in like suit, we will follow Those of us that have trusted in Christ on the last day will be raised to everlasting life with him, receive our eternal bodies and be with him forever. We're looking forward to that day. So 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So I want to encourage you, if you're here today and you're just visiting and you're without Christ, you don't have assurance of salvation, I want to encourage you, give your life to Jesus, say yes to Jesus. And you'll be raised on the last day. And we will celebrate forever together. And if that's you, um, just I'd, I encourage you to come up to myself or one of the elders. Can the elders just raise their hands? Just one of the elders afterwards and say, I want to make a commitment with Jesus. How do I do that? Um, and, and we really need the body. Once you, once you make that choice, you really need to be in the church because this is a team game. Um, and if you're a Christian here today, I want to encourage you, get equipped. Um, remove the barriers from your own mind. It took me a while. It took me a good couple of years. Um, and also, get equipped so you can go and save others. Lots of kids have these questions. Lots of adults have these questions, and there are answers. So thanks a lot for your time, and it's been a pleasure to talk with you.